Ian Beckcraft is my new friend, and he's also considered one of the top forces in AI and the future of work. So you know there's a natural interest I have to talk with him. I think you're going to enjoy our conversation with him. Ian is a trusted advisor to the world's most innovative companies, and he both inspires, teaches, and leads. Enjoy the conversation. Ian, it is fantastic to greet you here. There are a number of things that will be fascinating that we're going to talk about, but I want you to indulge me first and let us jump in a bit um, because I think it's interesting to ask you questions around AI and automation. Yeah? Absolutely. I'd be more than happy to jump into that. Fantastic. We'll go back to your childhood and all those other areas, but I just got to get into it because, you know, just a few days ago, I interviewed Kevin Kelly of Wired, and he said many things that rang true for me. One of them was to the effect of your job won't change, but your job description will. Then I saw your South by Southwest talk. Uh, you remember from a few months ago where you used the same mm -hmm. phrase or, or similar? Yes. Well, Kevin's an optimist, and so am I. Uh, my impression from what I've learned and enjoyed about you is that, yeah, you are an optimist. So uh, in the spirit of a discovery discussion, I want to talk with you about the unintended consequences and downsides as well of AI and automation. Absolutely. You want to jump into that a little bit? Absolutely. I, I think it's awesome that you had Kevin Kelly on recently. Um, he's had an immense impact on shaping my worldview. I've been reading his books for 20-odd uh, years now, um, and he's had a huge impact on the way that I approach the way I look at the future and the, the things that we do today. And it was also funny that we were back-to-back -back at South by Southwest. He was the hour before me uh, and before I went on with my speech. So I thought that was an interesting uh, way to have both of us there. But when it comes to AI and automation, and to your point, one of the things that has really resonated with people from that you know, was that this idea that we won't lose our jobs, we'll lose our job descriptions. And I think Kevin has a very similar perspective on things. Um, and I still believe that for the most part. I think there are some exceptions to the rule that there are, like any era of disruption, there are going to be specific populations which are impacted more so than others. Uh, overall, as a net to society, though, I do feel that that statement of your job description itself is going to be what changes more so than your employment still stands. Uh, if you take a look at the precedent we've had in the past, one thing I go back to is uh, people who were involved in horse and carriage around the advent of the automobile or for digital cinema, people who were what we call negative cutters, who would splice together streams of celluloid that were cut or filmed during the session to match shots together. And there's only one or two people in the world that have steady employment doing that now. They make a lot of money working for Spielberg. But the people in those professions weren't unemployed forever. They weren't put on breadlines eternally in places where they'd never had access to jobs before, which is oftentimes the default of where we go to when we think about automation being pushed out of a job or not having employment. Now, I also have to caveat that because you can risk sounding... Uh, brusque and and uh, insensitive to the idea of losing a job. I've been there and I know that that's unpleasant for anyone, especially at an individual level. When you lose a job, that's also a piece of your identity that is at risk. And I think that's part of why there's such a really important conversation being had right now about losing jobs and automation. And, and, and I'm so glad that you are uh, sensitive to that, not necessarily that you experienced it, but that you are sensitive to it because when you talk about losing jobs while it may be individuals who are asking sometimes the job loss occurs in communities or by community or by population and i think yes. given that we have so much advantage from this same technology to transfer and share information and be transparent about data then people can handle that in different ways that ends up feeling very particular to their circumstance. I think we need to dig in a little deeper into that. And given that you do have the sensitivity and experience around that, 
we have to be real about the impact to certain populations that this makes, even as it will feel like an advance for society on whole. Yes? Hundred percent, absolutely. And there's new research that suggests the roles that are actually at risk disproportionately affect women, and that is because most of the uh, the roles that are impacted are also um, more towards roles that are predominantly uh, women-led roles. So anything that has anything to do with uh, customer service or led jobs, those are also predominantly um, women led versus male dominated. Um, a lot of things that are around uh, assistant, like an executive assistant role, a lot of those are also predominantly women. There's more men now than there ever were before, but it's still predominantly women. So this pattern is kind of playing itself out in, a, I think they looked at about 16 or 17 different professions. In factories, and in factories, oftentimes mm -hmm. those jobs replaced robotically or through AI are impacting a whole community regardless of gender or ethnicity. People Absolutely. may populate by ethnicity and so feel to be different, but but it does have a ring to it, which means we have to think mm -hmm. about the re-education as well as the introduction of bigger and quote unquote better technology, yes? Absolutely. If you talk about geography and uh, location, uh, take a look at the Philippines where there's so much focus on outsourced uh, customer service jobs as well as technology. And if we're talking about customer service being automated, that's an entire country that's going to have a large portion of the jobs that they rely upon be impacted by this. It'll happen in stages. But if you take a look at the long term trajectory without what you're talking about, a reinvestment in education and upskilling, that will be devastating to a national economy. So there are elements that are uh, geographic, they're cultural, they're gender-based. It, it hits across the entire spectrum and it's going to affect a lot of people. I do believe, like I said, a net positive society, but not all net positive society just roll in without disruption and without impact to people. And that's one of the things I'm challenged by right now because there's so much hype around AI the hype of what it can do is almost overrepresented, whereas the challenges and potential harms aren't really discussed in detail and they're not given the, the time that they need. And, and the mitigation to that harm or to those risks, because when we look not just in the US, but across capitalist societies or societies that have elected officials, many of our elected officials don't have expertise in the very tech that they seek to regulate or pass laws around, whether that be about tax or humanity. There's just not enough education, which may in the interim require some measure of outsourcing of what historically has been an elected official's role to perform to. Uh, don't you think? I completely agree with that. The, the legislative process is slow by design. It's meant to move methodically and logically and carefully to be able to take a look at an, a very complex issue with any number of constituents impacted by it and turn it over a hundred different ways to create what will hopefully be the fairest version of legislation. Now, we all know, depending on where you live, that can be manipulated in any number of ways, whether it's lobbyists being involved in the writing of certain things that impact or at least more heavily favor one party over another. But when it comes to the, the pure form of legislation itself, without any focus on extenuating circumstances, the fact that there is such a gap of knowledge and expertise of how these things work to how they're going to be regulated is uh, alarming, but also expected. When technologies move at such an exponential pace, I mean, technology moves exponentially, organizations change logarithmically, creating something called Martek's Law, which is more applied to organizations where there's this growing gap between where technology is and the organization can adapt essentially creating a rift of disruption. Um, the same thing happens when you take a look at our institutions of government and that growing gap between the knowledge of what we need to legislate new and emerging technologies, we can only focus in so many directions. We have AI coming at us. We had blockchain and crypto became really hot last year. They're still going concerns. They're still very important to the infrastructure of the future of the financial system just not NFTs the way that they were being like auctioned off in art houses the last few years. 
So many people think that those things are just over and done with, done and dusted. We don't have to worry about them anymore. And all we have to worry about is AI. And if that was only the case, the legislator's job would be so much easier and yet still very difficult with everything they have to, to ingest. And that is why they lean so heavily on experts, expertise, people who are focused on the area of AI and ethics, um, the idea of monetary policy. So there's going to have to be more of a reliance on the people who are spending their time working exclusively in these domains to say, hey, how do we do this or have a conversation around this so that we can do that process, look at the issue from a number of different ways, think about this and do it methodically instead of trying to knee-jerk reaction and over-regulate something where we have seen that in some other new technologies, which has unfortunately pushed innovation to other places around the globe if we're looking at a US-centric way of doing it. Um, and, and I think they're careful about that. I've seen what's been happening in Congress. They've been very measured in the way they're approaching it, but there is an intensity in the interest of how this is going to impact the citizens of the United States and abroad. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, Ian, at the beginning of your uh, South by Southwest talk that we just referenced, you spoke to the idea some people have that civilization has already peaked, and you referenced the book by Robert Gordon. Talk a little bit more about that. That really was interesting mm -hmm. for me. I'd love to hear a little bit more of your insight on it. Absolutely. So Robert J. Gordon is an economist at uh, Northwestern University. He wrote a book, which I think is a fascinating read. It's about 700 pages long, so it's not going to be done in an afternoon, but it's called The Rise and Fall of American Growth. And he takes a very in-depth look at a number of different technologies that were um, essentially brought to society in, in the U.S. between 1840 and 1970. And his thesis is that the best days of the growth of productivity are over. And mm -hmm. his reasoning behind that is to say that the technology innovations that came from 1840 to 1970 impacted every aspect of our lives, from electricity, being able to give us things like refrigeration or electric power, um, moving us away from steam and coal, indoor plumbing. I mean, the, we were using chamber pots up until that point and things like mm -hmm. sewage and uh, plumbing and all that, that changed the game for clean drinking water it made a huge difference in terms of disease. Another interest in terms of being able to create cities that didn't have the same issues of like cholera and et cetera that were because of bad plumbing. Um, you take a look at the advent of the automobile. Now you have range that could carry you farther beyond what your horse and buggy could take you. Um, you have a mail system that isn't just about, you know, being able to take a letter, you know, that could be six months later, or you have the telephone, which helps the spread of ideas go beyond geographic boundaries. Now we take all these things for granted today, but each one of these innovations was met with some friction and some pushback. Um, the telephone and the train were actually both uh, predicted to tear apart the fabric of society uh, for some pundits. Mm -hmm. They thought like this was really the advent of the, the, the unraveling of our nation because it was going to take far flung ideas for from far flung places and embed them into the fabric of our nuclear family. Um, the TV, the New York Times famously said, uh, it, the average American family doesn't have time for it because they have to stay glued to a picture instead of the radio. So we constantly get these things wrong, but we also focus on dangers that may or may not exist with these technologies. But to kind of pull back to the idea of it impacting all these areas of our lives, when we get to Robert uh, J. Gordon's uh, thesis, he says, the stuff we're doing now is mostly IT, telecommunications, and uh, technology. And he's right. It, that is really the area, area of our lives that has, has had the most impact and innovation in it over the last 50 years. We have seen medical advances. We have seen impacts in uh, economies of scale and industrialization and globalization. But those are essentially extensions of those innovations when it comes to the assembly line. Um, I'm sorry? So, so you're not afraid that we're humanoiding ourselves, our, our, our civilization? Well, well, what I think is interesting about his thesis is he still does believe, like we, and I haven't heard him revise his statement since AI has come along, but he said even with AI back in 2018, 2019, you know, we've kind of locked in the benefit we're going to get from telecommunication. And mm -hmm. I disagree. I really do think that it's different. Um, I acknowledge what he's done economically, because if you take a look at 
the rising GDP and the stagnating um, wages, there is a massive rift between where that benefit accumulates. And I think that is one of the biggest challenges of innovation because it has accumulated and concentrated at the top and people who are working for organizations have not seen their wages rise. They have not seen the benefits accrue to them despite their productivity going up. And I think that's a very real challenge with AI as well. Um, I think there's several levers we can discuss there, but when it comes to the innovations here, I do believe that this is a exponential increase in the power of an individual and of an, as an organization. I believe that we are going to see massive increases across the board. This is going to revolutionize every aspect of our lives. It's not just telecommunications and IT anymore. It is medicine, it's science, it's education, yeah. it's logistics, construction. AI is the new infrastructure of the world. You could say it's like electricity. Who knows? If you take a look at the timelines of the next thousand years, it's probably bigger than electricity. So yeah. there are some pretty profound statements there. But I do believe, again, net benefit for society, but we're in that crucible right now of our society is not really ready for it. And we're kind of, we're grappling with the issues we never really knew were issues until today. Yes, yes, yes. Ian, so let me ask you something that I asked a group of interns uh, in our company just two days ago. I asked them to text into the chat. You can just speak to it. Uh, if they knew who the Jetsons are. Do you know who the Jetsons are? Oh my gosh, absolutely. I grew up on that. Oh, well, I'd, hey, I'd, I'd imagine I'm going to be horrified by their response. <laughs> they, they had no clue. They had no clue. So, you know, I have my own positive and negative on that. But I encouraged them to find out because Judy Jetson was a shero of mine. And I look, there, there is a graph, and I'll share it with you, a graphic after uh, our conversation. And it says the Jetsons really did predict and they had it right. Uh, you know, when you speak to all the fears people have about the impact of technology, the Jetsons really were advantaging in a positive way. And they were doing those things that we're talking about right now. So um, I really just so much appreciate your, uh, your insight. I, what I'd love you to do is give us a quick explanation of what the child of disillusionment and the slope of enlightenment are. You have viewpoints of where you see certain technologies today on those scales, yes? Absolutely. So when I'm trying to outline society's relationship to technology, one of the tools I use is Gartner's hype cycle. And the hype cycle shows on a graph and an X, Y axis that goes essentially all the way up, all the way back down, and then slowly back upwards. And there is the essentially the initiating point where something becomes culturally lot real cultural relevance. Then we get to the peak of inflated expectations where the hype really takes off. And then we crash into the trough of disillusionment, which is where metaverse and crypto are at the moment or were over the last several months. And then they eventually creep up to this plateau of productivity, um, which is like the unsexy march towards delivering on the promise that they originally had. So the way we get through this pipeline is when something becomes relevant and people start to latch on to it. You're seeing it with AI right now, where there's so much hype around it. Everywhere you look, AI is going to change this. AI is going to change that. It's going to kill us all. It's going to make civilization great. And you think it can fix your golf swing, take your kids to school, make you a sandwich, and also change your work life all at the same time. And what happens is people start to use these things and then realize it's good at a few things, but atrocious <laughs> at a few others. Like I really expected it could do these things and it's not even coming close. And you realize some of the hype has been very cherry picked and that these tools are not ready for prime time yet. Some of them are doing amazing things while others are just crashing and, and burning. Microwave, microwaves and microwave meals, not just birth to adulthood, right? Microwave and microwave meals. <laughs> Amen. I mean, that that is an example of like how you can take an application of two things that have amazing promise. And then also you get different results based on what is actually put in front of a consumer or a person. And the, the situation with this technology right now is people are waking up to where these uh, deficiencies are. And 
over time, that's going to take us from this peak of inflated expectations. And in, in my speech, I say, we're actually way up here. We're way beyond the peak of inflated expectations. And then when we crash into this trough of disillusionment, that's when people say, ah, it wasn't really all that great. Anyways. It was not what it was cracked up to be. Um, we had that happen with crypto, metaverse, Web3. But what happens with that, that's actually a good thing that that happens because it takes a lot of the financial speculation out of the markets, the people who were there more for the hype than the actual benefit kind of leave and focus on something else. And the people who are committed to the mission of that technology have the ability to work focused and undistracted, not being worried about the different shiny objects, the distractions, the hype. And over time, that gets us to that essentially a march towards productivity. And that's when things can scale. And that's when things are um, more robust and resilient to the types of problems they would have had previously. It gets us to a point where they're scalable that you and I can use any one of these tools and they at least come close, if not absolutely nailing the promise they had when we all were talking about the hype. Um, the challenge is people focus on that trough of disillusionment and say, well, yeah, you said you could do that like six months ago and it took you this long to get there. It's not magic. It's actually, and for now, it's people who are involved in building these technologies. So it does take time. It does take uh, market cycles. And this cycle is actually a good thing, even though it seems like the hype is a bad thing. It, it pushes interest. It pushes resources in the direction of development of these technologies. The trough eliminates all of the hot air and pulls that out of the room. And then it allows the technology to mature to a point where it's actually scalable and able to deliver on a lot of those inflated promises we saw at the beginning. And you you referenced until the time is scalable. Isn't it true about any, just about any product though, in its development or its adoption phases that it goes through this type of activity? Practically, practically any technology, especially at a societal scale, goes through something like this. Anything that has the possibility to disrupt an existing behavior is going to go through something very similar to this. Um, when it came to, I mentioned Web3 and crypto, we had the same thing with the television or even the telephone. The curves just take longer to get through than they do today because our adoption of technology is like at minute scale versus year long to decade long timelines. Yeah, yeah, I can recall my uh, mother-in-law when I first visited her uh, in England, and she was sharing all of the things that she's seen come into being during her lifetime. The telephone was one of them, modern uh, modern automobiles, and the list could go on and on, right? Because you know there was such a rampant uh, buildup of technology that followed the 40s and 50s that we don't look at because it's so much a part of our lives. And it's different than AI-infused technology. But she mentioned being afraid to put the phone to her ear. You know, what was it going to do? Yeah. Well, if you fast forward, I've got relatives and friends who say the same thing about the cell phone. And maybe they're justified. Yes. We don't know. But that's the case. But let's go back and talk about job descriptions changing, okay? Now, you do know that mm -hmm. my business is soundly based around employment. So I'm particularly interested to have these sorts of public conversations with futurists like you about the future of work. Our family are interested in this who are listening right now quite naturally. So this is a big topic. We don't need to rehash yeah. everything involved. However, other than people needing to educate themselves on these new AI tools to remain current and relevant, What's your current stance on how you see work changing and evolving the next three, five years, even the, the next 10 years? I think this can give us your perspective of present and near-term expectations that can be meaningful into our own lives right now. Absolutely. When I start talking about jobs and employment, and this has brought me to uh, a concept that called the age of the creative journalist. And most of our lives, we've gotten this narrative of you need to specialize in order to have um, protection and, and be employable. You need to have expertise. You need to have domain-specific knowledge. And that's what's going to guarantee you uh, not only a good education, but a good job, good job prospects, promotions, and you know a good, healthy um, career. And that was true for a very long time. And it will remain true to some degree 
going forward. There will still be a need for experts and deep expertise, but the push to specialize is going to change dramatically over the next decade alone and over the next 30 years completely. And the, that's why it's also going to impact the education system. And the reason this is happening is AI can become better than any one individual human at any subject faster than we could possibly imagine. We've seen it over and over and over again in the most complex games like Go, most recently, uh, another one um, called Cicero, which is a game that a master called Diplomacy, which is orders of magnitude more complex than Go. And Go is orders of magnitude more complex than chess. So it's mastering mm -hmm. these games that are really, really hard to, to understand. And Diplomacy is interesting because it actually requires coordinating with six other humans. So it's a machine understanding the emotional decision-making of six other human beings in order to play these games. So Why the machines six? are getting really Why good. Six? I'm Why sorry? Six? Why six? Um, so that's the, the, the number of nations that are uh, participating in the game of diplomacy. So diplomacy is actually um, a game uh, that reproduces a lot of the geopolitical elements of World War I. So you have mm -hmm. six other players in the room uh, with you. Um, and diplomacy games can actually go for hours or days on end. These were speed rounds of 15 minutes each. And within the course of a short period of time, the AI bot made by, uh, by Meta became one of the top 10% players globally in speed rounds of diplomacy. There's a whole website where they show how they did this. Very impressive. Um, but one of the interesting things they found is that when the AI told the truth 100% of the time, when it had the option to lie, if it told the truth 100% of the time, it outperformed everyone all the time. It would even tell you, hey, I'm going to do this to you. It's not in your favor, but this is what's going to happen. It would actually outperform the humans. It was very upfront. And, and I find that interesting. I find that has some very strong implications for society long term and our relationship with algorithms. Um, I don't think it's going to be monolithic in that way or universally in that direction, but I find that very uh, eyebrow raising. But when it comes to um, these algorithms and the way these things are being developed, they are getting really good at any one specific subject and also getting very good broad uh, subject related expertise. We've seen ChatGPT it can write poetry, it can write a graphic novel for you. There's all sorts of things it can do that expands our capabilities. So, so we test it. We, 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 Ian, let me interrupt you for a second and share with yeah. you. We tested Chat GPT uh, prior to you coming on this conversation and asked what we should ask you. And we were amazed that many of the questions lined up with what we'd already prepared to ask you. So, yeah. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> Well, I'm, I'm super curious to hear which where the differences were um, when we get into that. That's amazing. Yeah, yeah, we absolutely can. But I want to pull back right now to work. Mm -hmm. What do you think all of this mm -hmm. conversation translates into in terms of employment mm -hmm. statistics and what the workforce of tomorrow, for real tomorrow, right? Not future tomorrow, yes. really will look like. Absolutely. So this gets back to this concept of the creative generalist. And some people hear creative and they think artist, musician, and I mean it more broadly. I mean it about the ability to use your creativity to bring general skill sets to bear. And this, I think the people who are going to thrive in this type of environment are people who have broad interests. Uh, people like me who uh, most of their life still haven't figured out what they want to do when they grow up. They have a million and one interests. They're really good at a couple of things. Uh, creative Journalist has depth of expertise in a couple areas. And then they have a really broad range of hobbies, interests, exposure. Maybe they've had six or seven careers over a short, short period of time, but they've got a lot of deep expertise in a few places. And the AI doesn't make that deep expertise in, um, in, invalid. Like I was mentioning earlier, the deep expertise is at threat. What this does is actually creates more connective tissue for ideas and analogies. And those ideas and analogies allow you to combine concepts, ideas, and resources from different fields. And all of a sudden, you come up with really interesting ways of looking at the world and operating in different skill sets. The other thing this does is by having a broad range of exposure to different industries, ideas, um, actions, responsibilities, you can say, well, you know, I know how this is supposed to work. I know what output I'm looking for. I've seen someone else do it. And I know what I need. 
you know, the AI can take care of the rest. It abstracts all the technical detail, the years of discipline and investment it took to get to that output. As long as you can instruct it appropriately, almost like a good account manager can or a project manager can say, I need this from you. If you treat these AIs, and Kevin Kelly says this, he says, treat them like your interns. Um, mm -hmm. And that's exactly as you should talk to them. You tell the, your intern, here is the mindset I need you to get into right now. Here is the task I'm asking you to do. Here's what success looks like. And then here's how I want you to get there. You're very detailed about how you want it to do these things. And when you treat these AI algorithms this way and you approach them in precisely that kind of a formula, you get amazing things back. But when you say, yeah. write me the next novel, you don't get as much back. Yeah, and you're getting to a point that actually that I, I, I'm just about to ask you about. Um, so recently I was uh, in Goring on Thames in England for a friend's recommitment and after 25 years of marriage. And one of the things that her husband was sharing with me as a professor at a university uh, there in the UK is the question around how schools are managing AI and the student's use of it and whether the student is learning. My question for you is, will the advance of AI impact the ability for the masses to learn or will it dumb society down as technology gets smarter? Is that a fair question? It is, and I have a controversial take on that. My answer is both. Um, mm -hmm. Actually, it may not be controversial. I, I believe that it, technology has already done both. Um, if you take a look <laughs> yeah. at our attention spans, they're shorter than they've ever been. If any of us had to deal with that technology for a couple of weeks at a time, I think we can all go several hours, even a couple of days. But if I took away your use of technology for two months, how would we fare? I, I'd venture not well. And that's going to, our reliance is only going to increase as we rely on AI. That said, some people might really have a problem with that. You also have to look at how context of the world is shifting. If the world operates on that new model, then that's okay you're doing your reliance on technology is not the worst thing in the world because you need to operate in a world by its rules. So they may be good, really, some may be bad. Really need to know, so it's a question of, do we really need to know this stuff now that we don't need to know this stuff? Absolutely. And that Absolutely. doesn't make and it was, a okay. Yeah, it was the same thing when the calculator came along. Uh, mathematicians, most uh, math teachers were saying, you know, we. This is, we, we can't allow this. This is absolutely terrible. It's tearing away the students' clock. ability to think for themselves. The clock. The clock. The absolutely. Clock. Absolutely. So, and I mean, even the... Plato and Aristotle thought writing was a bad technology. So <laughs> there's a lot, lot to be gleaned from that. <laughs> yeah. What are some of the biggest mistakes you currently see large corporations making, especially in relationship to technology and work, though? Yes. Uh, looking at this strictly through the lens of efficiency. So uh -huh. this is not just about efficiency. When, when we work internally, we focus on two things, skill sets and workflows and how we can enhance polls. The challenge is we also live in a world where the marketplace rewards efficiency. And there are certain code words for efficiency and actions you can take that the market will reward. So if you're a CEO of a Fortune 500 company, layoffs are a fast way to boost your stock price and to get attention from the market and say, hey, look at me. I'm doing things that are great for the stockholder and I'm really focused on leaning down. And right now they're in vogue for a few reasons. One, a lot of technology companies overhired during the pandemic, thinking that their hiring and their productivity is going to continue to rise. And they're realizing, wait, we, do, we don't have the work to keep these people productive and not hit margins. So you're seeing 10 and 15% layoffs repeatedly. Um, and I don't think that's over. I do think especially the VC funded startups over the next year, we'll see a huge slash in uh, their survival rate. Many of them should be looking at M&A now, um, but many of them are also going to try and continue to figure out what their escape route is going to be. So we will continue to see layoffs because of this overinvestment that happened during the pandemic. And a lot of it will actually be blamed on AI because it's easier to say the world is changing when you adapt to it versus we made a big mistake by over investing early and taking investors money. No CEO is going to want to admit to that. So they'll say AI is just revolutionizing our business. We don't need this many people. We're going to make all the people we have here better and get rid of, you know, 30% of our staff. That I think is going to take over the headlines and people are going to blame AI for that. 
there will be some cases where AI actually legitimately can take over a role. But for the most part, it's going to be people kind of covering up other um, sensitivities in the business. Now, what we're seeing for businesses that are doing this well, I'll give you an example of our own organization. We have looked at AI as a way to increase skill sets and productivity and re-engineer workflows entirely. And with our staff, we don't remove anyone. What we've done is we've enabled our business to offer new products and new services at a higher quality than we've ever been able to in the past. And everyone becomes that much more productive. Um, we're actually doing something right now. We've just uh, aimed to deal with a, a big five consulting firm, become one of their visualization arms for a really awesome new design sprint that we're compressing a, what would typically happen over two weeks into four hours. And we have a whole team that takes what we would normally do in that two week uh, time frame, And we re-engineered how those processes would work, what tools we would use, and then how the work gets distributed amongst the people on the team. And it's really cool. Mm -hmm. It's, it's kind of like those science fiction command centers. You have a bunch of people working on something at the same time. You always use AI, enhance, enhance. It, it's, it's coming to life for us. Um, but oh, that's yeah. for us what we're seeing. It's, it's exponential productivity. And the organizations that realize how to use skill sets and workflows and investing in their people's education and upskilling and then re-engineering their organization around the people and the skills and the software, they're going to see exponential growth. The organizations that say, oh, I, I can spend the next month and a half working on a layoff and not have to think about it. And all of a sudden our stocks would go up 15%. They're going to see that crash in a couple of years when everyone else around them has realized this is not about efficiencies. This is about a new paradigm shift. This is about a new way of working. And the bottom is going to get hit pretty quickly if everyone's doing layoffs. You're all at the same margin again because you all race there so quickly. Whereas the people who think about how can I do this differently? How can I take these tool sets and make my people that much better, that more, more capable? All of their creativity gets to come to work. And one of the things I say in my speech is that as a creative generalist, you can bring your interests to work that maybe you wouldn't be able to bring to work now and get compensated for it, but you can perform competently in roles that are outside of your job description. And that's why I think the job description idea is going to go away because you might be senior accountant number two in the finance department, but your group wants to work on something that could really use some design help. You don't have anyone in the organization to do it. Well, you get to be the art director for the afternoon. And then you get to be the project manager later that day because you have the tool sets to do these roles in the moments you need to. And everyone is going to have access to this. So it's not like one tool takes away one person's job or one tool takes away one industry's job. It's we all are going to be augmented in a way. And if we choose to accept that, I am no longer just a strategist, just an accountant, just a designer. I am whatever I need to be in the moment that calls for it. We can lean on what I call just-in-time skills and just-in-time expertise or expertise on demand. And just like you see in the factories where things come in at the very second they need to be used for us, we're doing what the industrialization did to physical labor, which is it mechanized physical labor. And we are now digitizing skill sets. So the things that you need to use are now ones and zeros instead of years of education and experience. So if you think about it that way, you can augment your impact and your capability in a very short period of time. Masterful. Oh, masterful. Okay, let me ask you a chat GPT question. This is what sure chat thing. GPT. Okay, I'll ask you two of them. I have two of them. Am I correct in calling you an optimist? And the next is, well, if there are things about technology today that do worry you most, what are they? Chat TPT for the win. Those are great. Um, <laughs> I would say I, long term, I'm an optimist. Um, short term, I, I'm actually a pragmatist. I definitely, I, I find myself in the center. I disagree um, on both sides with the people who are naysayers as well as those who are optimists. I think there's a very, we're, we're challenged right now at this moment where there is a utopian vision of AI that it's gonna bring us to this promised land and transform society in ways we couldn't imagine. And that's true, but that also blinds us to the weaknesses of these elements of technology. And then there's the dystopian vision, which is Elon Musk saying it's gonna destroy the world. Uh, Alessio Yudkowski saying we need to uh, send airstrikes and missiles towards every AI facility now because we're all already dead. 
Um, the problem with these things, it's good that they bring up the different visions, but they paralyze us from doing anything because they don't talk to each other. They talk over each other. And it's very similar to so many other aspects of our society. Take a look at us politically. It's impossible to agree across the aisle. We're getting the same thing culturally. And we're moving into an era where the most important skill set that you can possibly have is the ability to hold two space for two opposing truths at the same time and say, this might not agree with this, but they can both be true. And I need to find out what that means for me. Because you can listen to either one of these talk about the scenarios, but that might not hold truth for you individually. It might not actually be true overall. And the other thing it does is it takes a spotlight away from people who are doing real legitimate work on the problems we face right now, not the problems mm -hmm. we face 20 years from now, which are still important. But the ones that if you walk past the red flags every single day, you will get to that future that is dystopian. You will get to that future that's undesirable. But if we, we can spend some time focusing on the things that actually have an impact on us today, but could also have an outsized impact on the foundational technologies we're going to build our society on, if we focus on that, we can make a real difference. And we stand a much likelier chance of getting to that utopian vision than if we just shout at each other all day. And that's my biggest problem with these two narratives is they're both right and wrong, but they take away from the issues that we, we can actually have something to do with now. And that's why I think there's a sense of hopelessness. People listen to these experts on both sides and say, well, I'm not as smart as they are. I don't know where to start or how to contribute. Whereas if you listen to the people who are doing work on the ground right now about things like systemic bias in the data sets, um, the way that the diversity is represented, not just in the models, but also in the people doing the work, all of these things, these are things we can address today that will have those exponential impacts and growing rate of return on our future. So that's where I like to, to start positioning those discussions is we, we can talk about the future and curing aging and cancer all day long. That's great. What can the average person do today? And there are a few things. One, by listening to those voices who are talking about, I'll name a few, but by listening to those voices who are going after the problems of today, but also raising your voice to be counted of what your opinion is on these things. When it comes to legislation, you have a voice that matters. When it comes to what your employment policy is around AI, you have a voice that matters. We're seeing this right now with the Writers Guild in Hollywood. And I may disagree with some of the things that are happening in terms of the demands, but what I wholeheartedly support is their right to bargain against the studios. And some of them are my clients. So I'm saying this openly when some of them I work for and to bargain for their rights because we are at an inflection point in society and they're the first real crucible where a lot of this is taking place, where we're grappling with the potential danger to employment. So, and they're right to say, we need safeguards and guardrails because we've seen historically, we've seen studios put more and more pressure on the writers, the producers, et cetera, to produce more with less. And we know they're already doing tests, but we want to have a say in how our field, our profession shapes. And we are all going to have that negotiation with our employers at some point in the next couple of years, whether we're active about it or not. So paying very careful attention to what happens with the Writers Guild. And soon after, sag after is going to be doing the same thing. The Directors Guild is going to be doing the same thing. So we're seeing this play out in Hollywood and the reason it's playing out there so quickly, one, timing of the contracts, but two, the exponential rise of, of technologies that impact the different elements of Hollywood, writing, visuals, graphics, deep fakes, all these things we've seen in the last five to 10 years now maturing all at the same time, all of them have a very big impact on core infrastructure of the movie industry. So it's really interesting as a social experiment as well to watch what's happening there to say, this could be a harbinger of things to come for me and my industry. And it may be, like I said, the technology could be for benefit, but it's not always the technology. It's us messy humans and what we decide to do with it. So can we trust the organizations to say, I'm going to do this for the benefit of everybody? Or are they going to say, hey, I can be really efficient with this. I can pull that lever and say, I've got 30% efficiency and I don't need people anymore. Or do we want them to put the work in and say, you know what? We're going to look at this a little bit differently. We're going to be creative about how we apply these tools to make this better for everyone. And ultimately, everyone ends up yielding more. But 
you can't trust everyone to do that. And that's why negotiations are really important. Yeah. And, 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 you know, we see this playing out, as you say, in front of us on both sides as well. If, let's think about our musical artists. You've got Drake, who we're told is absolutely mm -hmm. off board on mm -hmm. having us and his music re-represented through AI. And you've got Paul McCartney on the other side, who is using AI to bring the Beatles back to life and they're both artists taking different positions and you and I aren't taking a position with either one of them I just do tend to agree with you that there is reason for excitement around some of the most game-changing opportunities for civilization on hold with the potential applications of AI or the or the metaverse and we can come back to AI and automation I got to ask you one of the questions that chat GPT wants to ask yeah. okay if you're looking back and judging your life's work 40 or 50 years from now, how do you hope you'll measure success? Oh, man. Um, I really hope, so as a futurist, for me, it's about getting people to understand that they have a voice in the future. Um, mm -hmm. Too many people look at the future as something that happens to them, that it arrives and it's something that they just have to participate in. And I hope that my work, both as an individual and in our organization, can change enough minds that people can become active participants in shaping the future they want to see. Um, when I do my speeches, I, I say that the future is a contact sport that leaves no room for spectators on the sidelines. You're going to get hit no matter what. So if you lace up your boots and get on the field, you're more likely to participate in the wins and the losses that happen. And, but at the same time, you get to be a part of it and you get to shape the way that the game or life or reality is going. And I really hope that more people become active participants in shaping that future. And it doesn't start off by being an expert. It doesn't start off by knowing everything about a field. It just starts off by knowing that you want something different or better for yourself or others around you. And that's, that is the starting place. Once you've determined that, you know what? I know I want something better. I know I want something different. I don't even know what it is yet, but I'm going to figure that out. That commitment is what will push people towards asking for, demanding, and creating better futures for themselves and for society. And if I can judge my work in 50 years' time, I really hope that I can say I was able to help people understand that it was a real choice for them and that they made that choice and actively participated in shaping things. I love, 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 love that. I'm becoming such a bigger fan than I was before you came on to this conversation. Let's sober up a little bit uh, our enthusiasm, though, and speak to something that's real for people who may not be where you are or may not be inclined where I'm inclined with what you're saying. And talk with them about cyber threats, because these are ever-evolving and mm -hmm. um, we got to figure out how to stay ahead of potential vulnerabilities. That's a complex and crucial area for us to consider. Can you share either anecdotally or instructionally how we can address this uh, with our family? Absolutely. Um, in fact, I was just in Finland for the With Secure conference talking about this. Um, and the... Thankfully, the cybersecurity community has been in this space for decades. They've been using machine learning for 15, 20 years. They're aware of the growing threats that come from AI and machine learning, um, but society itself is not. So while at the enterprise level, you might have organizations that can protect and defend against a lot of intrusion attacks or social engineering, people like you and I might not be equipped for this. And the element of generative AI, the fact that you can generate assets, images, voices, audio at the click of a button means that the people who were already trying to scam you now have a new tool set. So if we're going to take the equation I was just talking about earlier, where my team is more productive than ever, we have new ways of being prolific in ways I never could have possibly imagined. And we're not the only ones. The adversary, the, the people who want to create havoc, that want to scam, that want to create chaos, have the same access to the same tool sets. And the people who call you to try and get your social security number or that try and convince you you need to pay the money over the phone, um, these are real businesses with hundreds to thousands of people employed to do this in order to make money. And they are investing in these tools. Um, one of the things that I showed during that conference was I played a scenario where I clones my voice 
using a 10 megabyte file from a YouTube video that is publicly available. And I typed in a script and then I typed in a script of uh, what could be a customer service agent for British Airways. And I basically set the stage saying, you know, this is a call that my partner could have gotten before I got on the plane and she wouldn't have known any difference. And it goes mm -hmm. like, you see an image of me and you hear my voice saying, hey babe, um, I missed my plane and my card is getting declined. I really need to get uh, on this plane in the next two hours. I'm gonna miss the conference. Um, can you give them your card details? I'll sell you the information. I'll sell you as soon as I possibly can. And then it goes over to the gate agent. You hear this British voice. Her name's, hi, um, my name is Charlotte. Um, let me know when you have your card details ready so we can get in on the next plane to Helsinki. And it has the details of where I'm going. It sounds like my voice. It sounds like a, a reputable person on the other line. And this took me fifth, no, five minutes to create. I just needed the audio clip and I was able to write the script out. And that's the kind of thing I can play through a phone line and you never know. Like, it's incredibly convincing. I actually played it for my partner and she's like, the only reason I could tell that wasn't real was because the gate agent sounded like it was recorded in a studio, but you sounded like you. And <laughs> she's like, I, if it was just you, I wouldn't have been able to tell. And we're seeing the same things in the news where people are told, you know, hey, your kid's been thrown in jail. Um, or, you know, it is, it sounds like their kid who's like, Hey mom, I've been pulled over by the cops. I need to get X, Y, and Z, or uh, I need money. Um, and they're falling for it. Thankfully, the one they news article, they actually, in some cases they are. Um, and in one case they were able to realize, Oh, my kid's in the room next to me. Who is this on the phone? Cause it sounded realistic. So wow. the, the people who want to scam and are getting better at social engineering. You're, you're, you're touching so so handily and is everywhere. And I think that's what's scaring people. The potential for good yes. is everywhere, but they get overwhelmed by the potential for evil. This morning's news, yes. as I was dressing, uh, did discuss a young man who actually committed suicide behind something similar where uh, someone, I believe they said from Nigeria, has set themselves up as being a peer age to him, female. He was he was a great kid on campus, you know, sports, everything. And the the circumstances in his interaction led toward his suicide. And even when he responded and realized he'd been scammed because they were saying, pay me money or I'm going to push these photos to your friends kind of thing. He um, said, oh, I killed myself first. They encouraged the suicide. So these things can happen. And the vulnerabilities become uh, exposures to younger and younger. Let me ask you this. When we think about, first of all, it gets, it gets into the human side of us and where we think we have the right to determine where humanity begins and ends. I remember, Ian, I was at a conference and one of the studies that was cited and shared with us was one where population, a significant population, because I think 800 is a significant test population, right, to ask around tech stuff. And they were asking a uh, population who self-identified as male, who like females, and they were between the ages, I forget now, I think it was like 18, basically college age people. And yeah. so give, given credibility, Ian, that some of it could have been jokes or when you did the drop down on it, though, it indicated a strong preference, like a 90 percent preference to have a Lily who is AI uh, customized to them over a live person. I don't woman. I don't know what that would end up being for us in, you know, a more uh, um, mature age population, but it did indicate that next generation at that time, that several years ago, uh, really saw themselves living with someone they created. We talked about humanoids earlier over someone who had been given a biological birth. Uh, so I think those kinds of discussions scare people. How can they though excite people? What can we do to change that around? Or is it a world of people still end up making their own decisions and selections? Yeah, I, I think it does. I think that there's, um, there's an element of holding grace for people who do things that you might find to be really challenging. And there, there's a growing, to your point, a 
percentage of population that just went through two to three years of where they would be able to socialize and build their social skills and integrate with society in ways that you and I got to, that they Mm -hmm. will never get back. And they spent years interacting digitally. So this idea of interacting with people through a screen is this is what social life is like. This is what it, it is like. And the idea of doing being in with people becomes less necessary or less desirable because it brings on additional anxieties because you're not as developed as somebody who'd gone through that their entire lives. And that is having knock on effects now because we're already seeing people that have actively built romantic and sexual relationships with AIs. There is a company called Replica that made the news recently where they had actually taken um, a functionality out of the chat bot, which would engage with sexual behavior. And it's a chat bot. Like it would, it's basically like sexting with an AI. Mm -hmm. And when that feature was taken out, the people who used it cried out saying, Hey, I, I feel like I just lost a girlfriend or I just lost a boyfriend. It was mostly men using it, of course, but people are leaning on these for remote romantic fulfillment and sexual fulfillment. And it comes as a shock to a lot of people. But if you think about the way humans develop emotional connections to things, we develop emotional connections to our pets. We develop emotional connections to characters in movies and books. I mean, when was the last time you got angry at a character in a movie or sad that somebody died in a movie? Like those attachments that are built in the course of 45 minutes to an hour. Um, And then as we were kids, we had like attachments to our stuffed animals. So it's not that surprising that we would develop an attachment of some kind, whether collegial, romantic, or sexual, to something, a machine that is designed to elicit emotional responses from you, custom designed. And they do and it better than a human, better in quotes. Better, better in quotes, exactly, because it might be more of what that person likes, but there's also this balance of what's healthy social interaction. If I am always getting what I want with no friction, if I'm never having to navigate a balance of partnership of when do I make sacrifice for my partner? When do I make space for my partner to do things that might really like tee me off and say, you know, I need to hold grace for you and hold space for this because I'm here for you. And when that boss is just always there for you, what does that start to do in terms of our expectations of our relationships with other people? So those are things that concern me. And as a futurist, I spend a lot of time thinking about these more dystopian possibilities because I need to go through that mental and emotional roller coaster in order to talk about these and say, I've spent time thinking about these, I've, I've grappled with them. And when I talk about them on stage or in a conversation, I oftentimes come off as like, I'm very emotionally cool about it. I, you know, it's no big deal, but that's because I've spent so much time thinking about it in the past that I've done my, my, ther- my talk therapy with myself about it before I start bringing it to, to the public. And I'm just a few steps ahead. I've done, trust me, I've, I've had my moments of panic, but it's one of those cases, the future isn't good or bad, it just is. Now we get to shape which direction it gets to spend more time in, but there are some examples of people who, who've talked about the romantic relationships with these things. And I think it's only gonna get stronger. I think we're moving into an age where today's challenge was how much time do our kids spend on devices Whereas mm-hmm. the future uh, challenge for parents could be how many synthetic friends do we let them have versus organic mm-hmm. friends? Because that's mm-hmm. going to happen. Mm-hmm. If you already take a look at the characters that they interact with on iPads, um, the characters from TV shows. What happens when their favorite character from a TV show becomes an AI that can interact with them on a one-on-one basis in any channel you can possibly imagine? They're going to develop a very strong bond to that character way beyond anything you see now. So, or when that character, or gone. when that character can, can grow or iterate in ways they want or in ways that they do, versus their pet dog who does have a lifespan and causes. How do we then manage emotion when we can manipulate, we can design yeah. our experiences the way we want them, versus experience them and grow and iterate in a human to human relationship. Absolutely. Absolutely. And what I think you're getting to me, it alludes to one of the statements you made a, a little bit ago. It's like, how do we navigate, you know, these different futures is either or, and it's kind of like the political spectrum. There, there are going to be people with different ideas of what a good life looks like. And that's going mm-hmm. to fragment more and more as more technologies come to the fore that can transform our ways in very significant ways. There are people who are going to be like, I'm all in and I will never have a romantic relationship with a real person ever again. This is all I want. Those people are going to be very, very, very small portion of the population, but they'll get the majority of the news because it's so different than what we're used to. 
then there are people going to be like, I kind of see where this is going. I know I don't like this idea, but over time they'll interact with these things more and more. And then it will just kind of happen by exposure. And there'll be a mix of most of my social life is with real people, but there is a bit that is digital as well. Or you might even re interact with representations of your friends who yes. create AIs of themselves, which is already happening. So oh, well, these are all different possibilities. And think about this for an aging population who may have lost a significant other or spouse. How do we then introduce uh, this same technology, this humanoid technology uh, to them to determine what the rest of their life looks like? It's endless, isn't it? It is it's a, it, the, the potential, potential for either. It's a, oh, incredible! There's there is so much potential in the uh, the realm of being able to age gracefully. At, at this point, I am so grateful that I'm growing up in this time because I want to live to 150, and I also want it to be a healthy 150 and a socially connected 150. Whereas, you know, if I grew up five or six decades ago the potential for additional health consequences given you know my own genetics could have been wildly different and the potential yeah. to be able to live disease free up until you know 100 120 is something that is right at the cusp of where we are today so the potential in front of us to do things like cure cancer cure disease alzheimer's to also age gracefully but also talk about socialization because that is one of the key factors in aging gracefully with health being part of the community, mm. uh, connected and loving community is something that people cite often is the number one factor as mm. to whether you'll age gracefully. And I think that even though AI seems cold and mechanical by its name, its ability to create companionship is very compelling. It's not there yet, it's very close. Um, but then we have to get to this idea of individual freedoms and say, do you choose to engage with that? Is that your choice going forward that you want to recreate a vision of your partner who may have passed or family members that you just, you really miss? Um, and how do you go about that? And that's where I think we're going to see a lot of different perspectives come about. I think the technology is going to happen no matter what, but the way that we navigate this as a society is going to play out whether we like it or not. Yes, it is. You know, we, we, we've covered so many things that I wanted to get through and I want to be respectful of your time. Ian, I appreciate your thoughtful expertise, your ability to express needed information in a way that non-techies can appreciate and adopt. Uh, you just have so much great insight on a number of topics beyond tech. Is there anything that you want to scurry around before we go to four for four? Oh, man. Um, I think we've gotten to, to a lot of them. I, I think that we talked about the, the, the doomsday and utopia stuff. We talked about impact of society. Um, I'm, I'm really ultimately excited about where things can go. But if I can leave anybody with one message, it, it gets back to that. You have a voice in how this happens. And you don't have to listen to me and agree with me. You can disagree with everything I say. And what I would say to that is, please speak up. Say something. Yeah do something, yeah. create something. It, the best way to get uh, to get back at someone is to create something interesting. Um, the best way to make your voice known is to make a point that other people can align with that disagrees with something else you heard said. So find a place where you want to create change and stake a claim, whether you're an expert or not. We need more non-experts now than ever, um, especially in a time where this affects all of us. So please, um, come and disagree with me, uh, agree with me, do whatever, just participate in the conversation. Wow, 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 wow. Okay, let's go four for four. Ian, I'm going to ask you four questions. Mm -hmm. You're going to give me four answers, no wrong answers. First question, if you can lean in on humans, that's great. Uh, but it is about mm -hmm. you, you get to invite four mm -hmm. people to dinner uh, oh, from any in history to now, who's at your table? Yes. Um, okay, so four is hard. And why? But... And why? And what? And why? Why are they at your table? Oh, why? Tell okay, us gotcha. So, and why? So I would say leading into minds that change the world, uh, I would go with Leonardo da Vinci and Buckminster Fuller. Um, Leonardo da Vinci is the quintessential creative generalist. 
Um, mm -hmm. The person who had the ability and the exposure and the curiosity, like if I could define him by two words, it was passionate curiosity. Nothing in the world was uninteresting to him. And even the things he wasn't interested in, he would still inquire, he'd be inquisitive about it, he'd explore it. And he essentially invented technologies that didn't come to the fore until 400 years after his death. So I would love just to have a conversation with him and see how his mind works. Um, Buckminster Fuller is kind of the Leonardo da Vinci of the last hundred years. Um, he's an architect by training. Um, he studies complexity. Um, he's also known for the buckyball, the geodesic dome, um, but incredibly prol prolific thinker. Um, one of his quotes uh, that I absolutely love and live by, and it, it, it echoes what I said earlier, is that uh, we are called to be the architects of the future, not its victims. And his perspective on creating the future was like, we are all called to build together, not to be victims of whatever might be coming our way. And I, I love how he says that. Um, and a, a person I would love to have dinner with, uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, um, for several reasons. One, completely changed the face of the Supreme Court. Um, but also it gets that idea of like holding opposing space for opposing truths. One of her best friends was Anthony Scalia, who ideologically could not be more opposed to her reasonings on the bench. And it, it resonates a lot with like Abraham Lincoln's presidency, which was a team of rivals. But she was able to find and build a really amazing emotional connection and friendship that was just a beautiful thing in an area where there was also contentious disagreement at stakes that were not just national, but global. I mean, if I can't get along with somebody I disagree with at work, and she's doing this with somebody who's literally shaping policy that will have decades of impact, there's a lesson to be learned there. So I would say uh, I would say her for sure. And then another person who I feel should, like shapes society is Martin Luther King Jr. And I don't have to go too deep on why I want to have him at the table, but I have an enormous affinity for people who decided that I'm going to stand up for something I believe in, no matter what it takes to get there. And all of these people that I've mentioned have had that to some extent, but I don't think anyone mm -hmm. on the list more so than Martin Luther King Jr. I mean, he gave the ultimate sacrifice, but he also was shaping society at a level that had impact for hundreds and of course, thousands of years to come. We haven't even seen the full extent of them, but I would love to have conversations with all of these people of A, what drove that fire that was inextinguishable? Just it, it came from a place that no matter what people did, you could not put it out. And then where did you get your inspirations? Where did your where did that fire come from? What made that fire bigger? And then what advice would you give to somebody who also wants to create change? And that would be the, the content of that that conversation. Wow. Wow. Okay, I'm coming to dinner too. I'll make it five and I'm coming. <laughs> That's, that's an do. awesome table. That's an awesome table. So, so let's go two for four. What four mm -hmm. pieces of music are you listening to and why? Um, so I am in Brazil at the moment. Um, we are expanding. We're opening a new office and I'm working with some clients here. So I'm listening to a lot of Brazilian music. Um, so two artists that I've kind of come into are uh, Ziga Balero and Alina Calisto. Um, they've, I feel like they have a really good a way of helping you understand the, the Brazilian culture and, and soul of its music. Um, mm -hmm. When I'm also listening to something else, when I'm studying, um, I'm a former uh, musician by training. So I listen to a lot of piano, uh, anything by Chopin, um, kind of really gets my brain going. And absolutely. Um, and then if I'm looking, if I want to listen to something where I want to listen to lyrics, I'm still listening to Kendrick Lamar's album from last year. And I'll just, I'll, <laughs> if I can't, I can't do anything else while I'm doing it because I'm just listening. Um, so that would be my fourth. Fantastic. Okay, we're going to go three for four. By the way, I was like, yay, for Chopin. My friend told me, okay, you know, Chopin is classical for people who really don't want to understand. I was like, that's okay. I'm <laughs> Yeah, tell, tell that to the Polish. They might, they might fight you on that one. <laughs> right. Uh, let's go three for four. What... Four books do you recommend to our family and why? Yeah, um, one that actually had a, a pretty profound impact on me in the last two years, and it's a, it sidesteps the technology conversation a little bit, is actually The Alter Ego Effects by Todd Herman, um, mm -hmm. who I've, I've worked with him and his group for a while for some coaching. They do an amazing job. And it's great for people who want to flex different parts of their 
um, their capability that might seem outside of who they are today. And he talks about how um, people like um, Serena Williams and uh, uh, Kobe Bryant built their alter egos to become the top performers that they were. Um, and then also mm -hmm. you have Beyonce, who is Sasha Fierce, um, and how they created these characters to embody things that they wanted to be, but their current personalities didn't really feel like they were a natural fit. And I and use this to enormous. We don't we often do that as children freely without coaching? Yes, absolutely. In fact, we, we have that coach out of us. Yeah, we yes, lose it along the journey. Hmm. Absolutely. What's your next? Um, so the other one is, um, well, there's two. One is math without numbers, because I believe that we're entering a, an era that if you really want to go deep into AI and science, you have to have an affinity for numbers. I was not a good math student. <laughs> I just was not. Um, but this has helped me kind of wrap my mind around concepts that are really um, coming to the fore with artificial intelligence, deep learning, machine learning. And now I can get into more complicated, uh, complicated con uh, context of calculus and algebra that I would not have been able to do in college or even in high school because the concepts were explained to me in a different way. And, and I feel like that type of uh, inf uh, information, there's no one called math, uh, a mind for numbers um, by a woman who teaches a class at Stanford on learning how to learn. Those two go together very well. And we're moving into a world that if you want to get deep into AI without having to be a scientist, understanding math and code is very helpful. But having to go a traditional route isn't necessary. Having to go get a degree in math or coding, it's not for people like me. It's not for most people. And having education that caters to a non-traditional way of understanding concepts in really interesting ways, I think is phenomenal. I think we're seeing more and more content like that these days. So I felt those are two really good examples. And then um, another one is uh, the alignment problem, which is about uh, what's happening with machine learning. And it talks about some of the problems that were in the data sets, the biases that are showing up in these uh, areas, um, the scientists that are doing a lot of work around how to bring this to the fore, like Dr. Tim Gabru um, and their uh, Decentralized AI uh, Research Institute. And they talk about the things that are actually being embedded in the models that you and I are gonna be using. So if you're looking for those areas where you can have a voice and make your voice known, a book like The Alignment Problem talks about those very specific areas of there's a problem here. Here is the exact problem. Here are the implications it has for society. And from that, you can decide how you want to take it forward. But I felt that does a very good job of kind of bringing some of the hype back to reality and explaining where there are things that need to be fixed today. Brilliant. Thank you. By the way, I'm going to pick up that first one you mentioned. Um, let's go four for four. What four pieces of advice, Ian, do you have for our family? And if you gain that advice from someone else, please show homage to them. Absolutely. So the first one is be passionate, curious, passionately curious. This is how I end every single lecture I give at a university. Um, when I talk to students, I said, passionate curiosity is the currency of success. It is what will drive you in a direction, find your, uh, your fire and fuel it with that passionate curiosity. Because if you don't have that, then it doesn't matter what other skills you have. You will only be able to get moderately good at best. Um, the next piece is to create something. It doesn't matter what it is. Find something based on that passionate curiosity and go and create. This also builds on my lectures for students. Maybe it's a blog, maybe you're creating some art with these new tool sets, but by creating, you get involved in the act of understanding. You can only understand mm -hmm. something so much by intellectually uh, observing it or spending time with it. But when you create with something, you engage your mind in a completely different way. And all of a sudden you expose yourself to different ideas. And then it usually leads to exposing yourself to different people and different communities. And all of a sudden you have something in front of you that you never could have imagined if you didn't start creating. So there was that. Um, the other one is actually from Kevin Kelly, and that is be very curious about the things you're not curious about. And <laughs> this is something I struggled with in my early days of my career. I felt like, you know, I'm ADHD. Getting me interested in something that you know I'm not truly passionate about now is not going to happen. And, and now that I'm 25 years removed from that, it's a different story. I realized this is going to impact me in some way. And, it, and I don't have an interest in this, 
but I need to find a way to make this interesting. Find a way, some angle, some perspective, some person who can help me find that passionate curiosity I can infuse into this. And, or at the very least, inspect it in a way I can find out why I'm not curious about it. Because that'll tell me as much about myself as it will about the thing I'm not so passionately curious about. And the fourth is, despite the fact that we humans are the messiest part of this technological equation, to have faith in humanity and to be a part of that faith in humanity, to actively drive towards creating more faith in humanity, because your choices impact someone else's perspective on that too. So you can be giving that forward. Um, I do believe that technology amplifies the whole spectrum of the human spirit, both the good and the bad. It amplifies the bad as much as the good. But if we are focusing more on what good we create and put into the world, then we can really skew that spectrum, spectrum towards the positive. And again, we can create those futures that we want. Wow. Hey, Ian, I pray that this was as good for you as it's been for me. And if I smoked, I go into the cigarette. <laughs> <laughs> Dennis, so, thank you so much for having me. It's been a joy to be on the, on the program. Thank you from my heart to your home. Thank you.